Alvastoke Antiviral discusses a crisis of faith in Habakkuk, and we reach you the start of Revelation. You're watching Alvastoke Antiviral. Well, hello and welcome to Alvastoke Antiviral. It's lovely to have you joining us. Good morning or good afternoon, Colin. Good afternoon, Andy. So we're doing the Sunday reach you now. We're going to reach you Revelation 1. Yep. And you've got some questions for me? Yep, we'll go with that. Good. Um, the first one was you mentioned in your talk on, about Revelation on Sunday that it's not a book that's designed to confuse us, but to make things clear. So why do you think there's been so much confusion over what Revelation is saying? Do you think it's down to the nature of the type of writing that it is with visions and images or could it be because of books written about the second coming of Jesus which have been rather subversive or causing us to have preconceived notions about what we're going to read in Revelation before we read it or is it something else is it simply that we've never really looked at the book and given it time and thought there's all sorts of options there mm. yeah I think mm. it could be it could be any of those I mean to some extent, I think the basic message of Revelation um, about Jesus winning in the end, I, I think you can get that from pretty much any way you approach the book, uh, unless you totally fixate on the details. And, but, you know, if you read it from start to end, you realise who Jesus is at the beginning and you realise the glorious end and you hear him saying, behold, I'm coming soon and all the calls to persevere and to overcome, you know, that is the basic message, you know, however we thrash out and interpret the the, the content, you know, it shines through on, on, on multiple readings that Jesus is going to win. He is going to be the king and the, the, he's going to reign and he's going to save his people um, and judge the world. And that is, that's the good news that I, I think you can, you can get from it, even if you don't understand what's going on with all the seven seals, all the seven trumpets and things. Um, it might be that, as you suggested, it might be that we're just not familiar with the writing style. I think that's, I think that's a lot of it about why people come to very different conclusions. Um, it might be from external confusion. So, you know, I believe that Jehovah's Witnesses at one point were very literalistic about the whole 144,000 in Revelation 7. And people can try to squeeze the rapture or the so-called rapture, because I, I think it's a, a doctrine which is, um, doesn't really uh, come from the New Testament is from a misreading of the New Testament it, it gets squeezed into Revelation somehow because we have people say oh it must be there well this is what's going to happen and I think some of that can cause confusion um, as well and um, it might be that we're, we're not very familiar with it although you know I think it is meant to reveal things to us and you know I think that people you know I know one Christian who the first book of the Bible he read was Revelation um and i think um yeah it has a certain interest for people so i would certainly encourage all of us um as a church as we look at it this time to to sit down and read it um and hear the message that comes from it uh, as it reveals uh where this world is really going and who's really at the center of it hmm. and it might be a good idea if people do read or those of you listening do read revelation straight all the way through to mark down the points at which you think it's describing Jesus coming back and mm. the final day um, because it just might help highlight certain aspects of the book I mean you could mark other, other things but that might be helpful mm. Mm. good now how much does a knowledge of the Old Testament where we do have certain books that have um, similar types of imagery in them particularly thinking of Daniel and Ezekiel um, but there's other books as well um, how do those help us when it comes to understanding the book of Revelation? Well, I think that's, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, th I think it's absolutely crucial um, because so much of the language of Revelation is straight from the Old Testament. Um, if you, if this, you know, if the book of Revelation were a web page, almost every verse would be a hyperlink that you could click on and it would take you back to Daniel or Ezekiel or Isaiah or, some, or Exodus or something like that. Um, because John is, is using the language and the building blocks the Old Testament has given us. Um, and he's seeing those um, being fulfilled. There, there is a book that, uh, about Revelation that it, I think it's called the, the Climax of Prophecy or something like that. 
Um, because the point is that the climax of Old Testament prophecy is found in Revelation because it picks up all these points. And therefore, yeah, I mean, even on Sunday's reading, there are loads of points we could have gone to the Old Testament and dug around. Someone emailed me about the sevenfold spirit and said, oh, is that to do with how the spirit is described in seven ways in, in Isaiah chapter 11? Um, and, you know, again, that's a piece of background. We didn't have time for that, but that's a piece of background where the spirit of God is described as the spirit of wisdom and so on in seven ways. And that might be what John is, is referring to. Um, in part it might be that it's described in seven ways there that to demonstrate his complete sufficiency and therefore he's alluding to that and so yeah i think it's very important um at the same time i don't think we have time for that in a in a talk every week because otherwise we just do nothing but look up old testament passages and we'd miss the wood for the trees wouldn't we and we'd miss what the passage is saying as a whole so uh, we've got to go and work out what's going on and you this week colin you know all those images from daniel and stuff and eyes like blazing fire and feet like burnished bonds and all that stuff uh so you know there's so much there and so there's yeah we, we really need to understand it in the context of the old testament um scripture interprets scripture and so we need to let the bible uh guide us and not just pick up revelation in a vacuum and read through it with modern spectacles and assume that um you know that, that we can just sort of um take it straight to our world without understanding what did it mean for john's first hearers back in the day because it must have meant something for them because it was written to them in the first instance and to understand that we need to understand the writing style apocalyptic and to understand that we need to remember the old testament yeah so i think it's very important okay well we'll look out for references backwards perhaps later on um third thing um this will probably be not a problem for most but i remember my dad had a Schofield Bible in the house. I think it was the one he used at a certain point. And um, in it, the headings, you know, the little headings that we have in italics in our Bibles today, um, over each one of the seven letters, there was a, um, a set of dates and they ran on from one to the other um, up to more modern times. And then I remember when I got a Bible, I decided to get something easier to read. I got RSV couldn't understand why where all these dates had gone and I made it up um where did all that come from was it um a tendency to read um revelation as being a sort of a continuous sort of clock ticking right the way through the book without any other um yeah any other sort of interruptions or disruptions on route yeah I think so and I you know I, I think there are some reasons why you might come to that conclusion if you pick up Revelation and read it. Um, John says things like, after this, I looked and I saw this. And then after this, I looked and I saw this. And so you can, and because most books that we're familiar with and you know, many like the Gospels follow a historical timeline, where although sometimes the Gospel writers move events around, don't they? So yeah. ancient writing styles might have different conventions to ours. Um, but it's not surprising that on first reading, you know, you might think, oh, this is just a straight line. But as you say, um, the, the closer you look at it, the more you realize, actually, it's a lot more like, say, Micah or, or Isaiah. I mean, you know, we get salvation and judgment happening in Isaiah, in Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 2. And then throughout the rest of the book, and we end up, you know, with a new creation in Isaiah 66. But it's not a linear thing. It's, it's looking at the same events again and again and turning them over and looking at them from different angles and explaining about what God is going to do. And um, I think if we, as you suggested, if we read through Revelation and say, um, where are we at this point? It might not always be immediately clear, but you know, where it says that the day of his, his wrath has come, um, like at the end of chapter uh, six with the, the sixth trumpet, um, and then we see the, the saints who have come out of the tribulation and they will never hunger and thirst and he's going to wipe every tear from their eyes in chapter seven. You know, that is, that's the end, isn't it? But also God will wipe every tear from their eyes in chapter 21. So that's the end as well. And then as you, as you read through the book, you start realizing, oh, that sounds like judgment day as well. Uh, and oh, it sounds like Babylon has fallen there. Oh, but then Babylon seems to fall again. 
um, and and you start to realize that we're we're going over the same events in a in a sort of cycle. Um, and the after this I looked is probably referring to the order of the visions in which they were seen and presented, rather than here's a timeline. I saw this, I saw this, I saw this, I saw this, and this is a you know, we, we need to sit here with our history books and newspapers and plot exactly right. This event's happening, so in five minutes' time, that one's going to happen as well. Um, yeah, I, I think it's more persuasive to see it as overlapping visions. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, and what would your counsel be to people who have some background of the Bible and have read Christian books about Revelation? Um, do you think they should put all of them in the bin and just listen to our talks over the next few weeks? or? <laughs> or what would your advice be? No. <laughs> <laughs> Probably pay good money for those books. That's um, true. No, I, I think um, I think we do need to position ourselves with humility uh, about how we hold some, you know, some readings of Bible books. Um, I, I think the basic me message of Revelation comes across in most readings like even you don't need to understand all the all the overlapping visions to be greatly fed by revelation 21 and 22 and the truth it reveals about the new creation and and revelation 7 for that in fact you know these are nurturing passages of god's word and what i'd say is it's here to make it clear using these big dramatic picture languages of disasters and lions and lambs and beasts uh, to cartoon for us the world we live in and what's really going on and where it's going and so, you know, let those images um, come to life, as it were, you know, um, be struck by them and, and see how uh, John explains the realities that are, that are here about Jesus being Lord and Saviour and how it's going to come um, through a suffering period of, um, of, of the church age and then in a great climax of judgment. Um, and, and you'll, yeah, you'll be fed by that. So, yeah, I, I don't want to tell people to be, uh, afraid of it and um yeah I, I think you know books might get things right and you know um so yeah just keep thinking keep reading and keep spiraling in um as you as you get a handle on, on what you think revelation is and how it works and how the images work and um things get clearer i think okay good. do you have anything to say on that um, no, I was just thinking that maybe towards the end of the series, we might recommend a couple of books on Revelation that um, could be really helpful to consolidate some of the things that we look at ourselves in church. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Great. Well, that is the Sunday Meet You. Thank you, Colin, for those questions. Now we're going to go to the book of... Habakkuk, uh, which is our book of the week. Um, and what we're thinking about today from Habakkuk is uh, this question. Have you ever had a crisis of faith? Um, have you ever been in a situation or a circumstance, uh, maybe about something small, maybe about something big, uh, something as small as pain in the neck, perhaps, or something as big as a sort of disaster or uh, uh, something on the, on the world stage that's awful but sometimes you can come up against something uh, and it can stop you in your tracks and you can think how can God be allowing this and I'm not talking about the outside objection to the Christian faith the argument an atheist might make I'm talking about an, uh, an inside uh, struggle that a believer might have thinking how can God allow this because you might know the gospel you might believe in Jesus you might trust his death for your forgiveness but you might have times where you really struggle with things you just don't understand and they become really burdensome to you and it's not an intellectual block it's more a sort of emotive visceral struggle and it sort of triggers a, a, a crisis how can God be allowing this how do we how do we deal with that kind of experience well Habakkuk is very very helpful on this because Habakkuk is a short uh, prophet with three chapters and it starts with Habakkuk's complaints against God because he's going through a bit of a crisis and it ends up with him being brought to a resolution in his faith as God speaks to him and shows him how and why he should trust him and it starts uh, with Habakkuk's complaints and it becomes clear he's having a bit of a crisis of faith. Uh, the prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received, how long Lord must I call for help but you do not listen 
or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. So can you see there Habakkuk is complaining to God. How long, O oh Lord, when are you going to answer my prayer? When are you going to do something about injustice? Now you can see, can, or can you see there, verse 2, how he's calling out to God. So he's, he's a believer. He's not an unbeliever, uh, making an argument, oh, suffering, therefore no God. He's, he's a believer who knows God and trusts God, but he's calling out to him. I've got this problem. Um, how long am I calling out to you? And you're not doing anything and the particular objection, verse 3, is about injustice, wrongdoing. So that's his problem. He's got a problem with injustice. He's looking around where he's at, which is almost certainly Judea, uh, Judah and Jerusalem, and he's deeply, deeply upset at the evil behaviour going on. And again, I think this is a very emotive objection as well as a logical one. It's not that Habakkuk is, is thinking, hmm, this doesn't make rational sense in my head. Um, he's thinking, I can't bear this. I can't bear that there's this violence and this injustice and this, this destruction, verse three. And justice never prevails, verse four. I can't bear it. I saw um, earlier a certain TV presenter had a strop on air. Uh, on Tuesday and walked out of the studio live on air because he could not bear what was being said to him. Um, and it's that sort of agonizing burden, I think, that Habakkuk has. An emotive complaint It's not just about injustice, it's about God as well. God, how can you let this injustice happen? How can you be good and, and God and everything I believe about you if you're not doing something to fix this event, I, this situation, I really care about. So that's his crisis of faith. And perhaps you have some sympathy with this crisis and this complaint. And God answers him. Um, and he says in his answer, or in his first answer, he says, chapter one, basically, I am raising up the Babylonians. Here's what I'm doing. Uh, I have seen what's going on. And my answer is, I'm raising up the Babylonians. I'm going to raise up a people to come and conquer my own people. I am going to do something about injustice and what that will look like in the first instance is an invasion. And this is something obviously we've talked about from the rest of the Old Testament, the Babylonians taking over Jerusalem uh, in the sixth century BC. Uh, Judah was taken over by the Babylonians. Here God is saying I'm going to do that. So Habakkuk is obviously written uh, sometime before that. But then here's the problem. God says he's going to raise up the Babylonians. But Habakkuk then says, well, this doesn't fix my crisis. Actually, this makes my crisis worse. So this is, uh, well, verse uh, 12 to 17, I believe. Uh, uh, no, yeah, verse 12 to 17. Um, Lord, he says, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Can you see what he's saying there? He's saying, God, you're eternal and you're holy and you're appointing these people to judge your people. How does that work? That doesn't make it any better. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. So why are you using evil people, people who are more evil, the Babylonians, uh, to destroy uh, your people, swallowing those more righteous than themselves? In God's previous uh, words, he had talked about how destructive the Babylonians were. He, he called them that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. They're, they're terrifying. And Habakkuk has, again, a problem with this. It doesn't actually fix his crisis of faith because the Babylonians are horrible. They're ruthless. And uh, Colin, do you want to read the second column as well? Yeah. You have made people like the fish in the sea, 
like the sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet, and so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet, for by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? Mm. So there we have, particularly that last verse shows us he's talking about the Babylonians. They're destroying nations without mercy. And he uses this fishing image. They're like the evil fishermen who are catching the nations and rejoicing as they catch them in their clutches. Uh, and notice in 16 as well, there's idolatry going on. Um, he sacrifices to his net and burns incense. So they're worshipping their, their net. They are, they are worshipping their strength and their ability and, and the things that give them power to catch and destroy and conquer other peoples. So um, they, are, they are idolatrous. They don't worship God. They worship their own power and might. Uh, and for by his net, and you know, he burns interest, incense to his dragnet, this absurd image uh, of, of these people. Uh, but that is saying something about what's going on in their hearts. So they're not good people. They're horrible, these Babylonians. And Habakkuk is saying, how, God, can you be allowing this? How can you be, um, how does it fit with 13? Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. I can't square this with who you are, God. Now, most of the time when people demand an answer from God about something like this, God, why are you allowing this? Why are you doing this? God doesn't answer because uh, he doesn't have to. He doesn't need to explain himself to us, just as he never explains himself really to Job. Um, but on this occasion, after Habakkuk's second complaint, when God has said he's going to raise up the Babylonians first time around, then he responds to Habakkuk's complaint. Um, and Habakkuk says he's standing watch on the ramparts in chapter 2, I'll stand on the ramparts. I'm going to wait and see what God says. And then chapter two is God's second answer to the second complaint. And after the second answer, we then get chapter three, which is a vision Habakkuk gets and sings a, a, a prayer about. Um, and both chapter two and chapter three basically have the same message, I would say. Um, they're messages uh, which basically explain something that God is saying in answer to this objection. Habakkuk saying, God, how can you allow this injustice? How can you use this evil? Um, and God wants to remind him of something that he should already know, um, that um, he needs to understand um, that God will save and he will judge and he will be glorified as he saves and judges. He will be glorified as he saves and judges. So don't stop believing. I think that's the message of chapter two. I think that's the message of chapter three. Uh, we see it in chapter two in the form of a list of woes. So if you've got a Bible, uh, you can see God starts answering in verse two and tells him to write down the revelation because it's going to happen. Chapter uh, verse four and five talks about the evil of the Babylonians. The enemy is puffed up in contrast to the righteous. Um, but then from six onward, we get a taunt. Will not all of them taunt with ridicule and scorn saying, woe to him who piles up stolen goods. Skip down to verse nine. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain. Verse 12. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed. Verse 15. Woe to him who gives a drink to his neighbours. So this is a taunt. This is woe, 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 woe. Um, it's God saying, What's going to happen is the Babylonians are going to be judged. He is going to judge and he is going to save. Um, and these woes, each of them pick on a certain aspect of the Babylonians behavior. And God explains that they will be judged. Uh, the first woe talks about piling up stolen goods and how the creditors are going to catch up with them. Uh, and uh, they've shed human blood, so they will be um, in trouble. Uh, they've built their house by unjust gain, they've built the city with bloodshed, uh, they've given drinks to their neighbours uh, to gaze on their naked bodies, um, and uh, the idea is that God is going to actually judge them for these. Woe to you because you've done this, and therefore God's justice will catch up with them. Um, so what God is saying is that he will judge them. Habakkuk needs to remember that God will judge them. 
Um, but here's a special thing, particularly in this chapter. As he judges, and therefore saves his people, as we'll see, as he judges, the glory of God will be revealed. And this is in verse 14. Um, so in the context, we have the woes to him who builds a city with bloodshed. And God has determined that the people's labor is just fuel for the fire. It's not going to go anywhere. They're great city building, empire building achievement, these Babylonians. For, verse 14, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So God is going to be glorified in the end. Now, do you remember what the Babylonians were worshipping, Colin, in the first chapter? Their nets. Their own nets, yes. They were idolaters, worshipping their own power and might. They weren't giving glory to God. God's glory was being suppressed by sin. And God is saying, no, it's not going to last. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Globally and dramatically, his glory is going to resurface and be displayed. And the very thing actually that um, has been lost in, in, in sin as, as the glory of God has exchanged is going to be re-established. And this is so important because actually the glory of God is the thing Habakkuk needs to keep believing in. Because ultimately crises of faith are about the glory of God, I would suggest. Crises of faith are about the glory of God because crises of faith are what, about what God is like. What is God like? That's the question Habakkuk's actually wrestling with. He's seeing this awful situation and he's saying, God, how can you do this? And his crisis is, are you really who I believe you are? Are you as good as I believed you are? Why aren't you doing this? Um, he's, his faith in God's character um, is what's under fire. And the glory of God is the display of his character. It's God seen for who he is. It's God recognized for who he is. It's the display of his brilliance and perfections and his character. And that's the very thing that Habakkuk is, is being called to question. Um, that's often what's at stake in our complaints too. Is God good and perfect and holy? How can he be if dot, dot, dot? What is God like um, given this? thing we see before us and we lose sight of the glory of the god in crisis of faith we struggle to keep hold of it and without a glorious god to believe in our faith doesn't have anything to hold on to so can you see god is stressing here no you will see my glory i will judge and you will see that i was worth trusting in all along because one day the knowledge of the glory of the lord will fill the whole earth and you'll be able to see my glory and therefore don't stop believing. Don't stop believing. That's the implication. And it's also why we get the famous verse, Habakkuk 2, Habakkuk 2.4, I should say, not 14. Uh, Behold, his soul is puffed up. This is the Babylonian. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. And so in this big where God is describing the evil of the Babylonians, um, what what um, God does turns aside to, to draw a contrast between the unrighteous, whose soul is not upright, and the person who will live, who will not fall under the judgment. The righteous shall live by his faith. And that's such an important verse for the whole Bible, quoted in key moments in the New Testament. Uh, Habakkuk 2 4, the righteous shall live by faith. Um, because it shows how much of a contrast there is between those facing judgment and those who will be saved. Some will live. And who are they? Well, they are the righteous and they shall live by faith. Um, and in the Old Testament, this term normally refers to faithful behavior. And that's interesting because Paul uses it to talk about faith as opposed to works. Um, here in Habakkuk, probably both ideas are implied by this term faith or it's sometimes translated faithfulness um it's the idea is the righteous will live if they have faithful trust which uh leads to faithful behavior it's a package of those ideas um and that faithful behavior comes from a faithful trust in god doesn't it it's it's a fruit of faith we're not saved by our good faithful behavior but our, our faithful behavior flows from the fact that we have faith empty-handed faith in the god um revealed in the Bible. So this is the faith that God is talking about. It's a living faith 
um, that will be the thing that Habakkuk needs. Um, don't stop believing because the earth will be filled with the glory of God. Um, he will be glorified in the end uh, as he saves and as he judges. Uh, that's the message of two. And in chapter three, we get uh, basically, I think, the same ideas gone over again, but in this glorious poem, or it introduces a prayer um, in chapter three, uh, which displays the very same message that God will be glorified in saving and judging, so don't stop believing. So if you look at it in chapter three, you can see um, Habakkuk starts by asking God to repeat his awesome deeds, verse two, in our day. And then he starts narrating a vision of God coming. Verse three, God came from Timan, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed, but he marches on forever. And so on. If we jump down to verse 11, sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath, you strode through the earth. And in anger, you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. To cr you crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. So we've got salvation, we've got judgment, and we've got the glory of God. We've got God being glorified, his glory filling the heavens, as we saw, as he comes in judgment and puts an end to the Babylonian evil and saves his people. So there's this enormous vision. Um, that Habakkuk has of God's glory being revealed as he comes to save and judge. And that is basically the message. That's the thing that he's been reminded of, the truth that we've seen all through the, the Old Testament, that God does save and he does judge and he's promised to do both. And Habakkuk, in his present moment, isn't experiencing that, is he? But he's reminded he needs to wait for God because God and his glory will be revealed when he comes to save and judge and therefore he shouldn't stop believing because god was worth trusting in all along and the question is will we believe that this is the end of habakkuk uh, colin could you read this for us yet i will wait wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food Though there are no sheep in the sheepfold and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. For the director of music on my stringed instruments. Mm. Yes, reminding us that this is a musical prayer. It's like a psalm. Um, and this is the personal moment at the end. We've had this great vision of the coming glory of God as he saves and judges. And Habakkuk looks at his situation and it doesn't look good, does it? It's a bit like 1917 where they walk through that orchard where all the trees have been cut down. You know, the fig tree does not bud. There are no grapes on the vines. Miserable. The olive crop fails. The fields produce no food. Disaster. The world is going to pot. There are no sheep in the sheepfold and no cattle in the stalls. Rubbish present moment, isn't it? It sounds like a disaster. It sounds, uh, you know, a bit like, you know, COVID plus a load of other natural disasters all happening at once. Yeah. In that present moment, Habakkuk says this, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my savior. He doesn't stop believing and he doesn't stop believing because God has reminded him that God will be glorified as he comes to save and judge. And because Habakkuk has that promise from God, he can trust God. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He can rely on God to be his strength, to make his feet like a deer, to tread on the heights, um, and he can have joy as he trusts. And so Habakkuk takes us on this journey. It starts with Habakkuk complaining against 
uh, the, what's going on because of the injustice and saying, God, where are you? Is crisis of faith. And it ends with this wonderful expression of faith. Um, he rejoices in God, his savior, because he is being reminded that God's glory will be revealed because God will judge sin. So the things we care about that burden us, that we think this cannot be okay with God. Oh God, we can't understand why you're allowing this. God will sort those things out in, in his time. And the salvation that looks like it might never come um, will come. It is coming. And therefore, whatever state we're in in the present, whether we've got sheep and, or cattle in the stalls and the, the olive crop failing or whatever's going on, um, don't stop believing because we can rejoice in the Lord because we have his promise. Um, and though it looks tough and it looks rubbish in the present, what God has said is enough for Habakkuk. And so it's, it's about faith, really. The book of Habakkuk is about the faith in the glorious God who saves and judges. Uh, faith which is in crisis at the start, which is, um, was, this is a resolution moment here at the end. Uh, because the righteous will live by faith. It is through faith in this God um, who became fresh in Jesus Christ and saved us by dying on the cross and will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Um, it's through trusting him um, that the righteous shall live, that we are made righteous, uh, declared righteous in God's sight. Um, and therefore, um, don't stop believing. Don't stop believing. Uh, it's e so easy, isn't it, in present circumstances where there are no uh, grapes on the vine and so on, to have crises of faith and to struggle with that. And whatever you're struggling with, I don't know, or whatever's burdening you or is is causing you um, pressure in terms of uh, how you're clinging to your faith in God, um, read Habakkuk and see the glory of God, given this little glimpse here about what it will be like. And come to this moment and see if you can say these words as well. That I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Saviour. Don't stop believing. That's the tagline. And that's my doorbell. Um, any thoughts, Colin? No, that's right. Thank you. Good. Okay. Well, we'll wrap up there. Stay close to Jesus and wash yeah. your hands.